Good morning. Thank you for joining me again today and being part of our program. This morning, I want to go back just for one minute to what I was saying to you yesterday. If you were with me, yesterday morning was one of the most vital things I've ever said over the air to you. We talked about the challenge that Jesus gives us, where he says to us, If anyone would come after me, he must deny himself, take up his cross and follow me. It's the moment in time when you make Jesus Christ your Lord. When you give everything in your life to him, you cannot have a more vital moment than that. But having said that, let me tell you something else. If you're a Christian believer and you allow Jesus to take complete control of your life, then the Holy Spirit who dwells within you will begin to fill you to overflowing. I believe that is the baptism, the filling of the Holy Spirit. The moment you surrender all to Jesus is just as though self that blocked those channels is out of the way and the Holy Spirit can flow freely through you and you are filled with the Holy Spirit. It's a tremendous moment. You may or may not have a special experience, but the fact will be there and you will be new. We'll come back on that another time, but let's go on. Chapter 9, verse 2. After six days, Jesus took Peter, James, and John with him and led them up into a high mountain where they were all alone. There he was transfigured before them. His clothes became dazzling white, whiter than anyone in the world could bleach them. And there appeared before him Elijah and Moses who were talking with him. Peter said to Jesus, Rabbi, it's good for us to be here. Let's put up three shelters, one for you, one for Moses, and one to Elijah. He didn't know what to say. They were so frightened. Then a cloud appeared and enveloped them, and a voice came from the cloud, This is my beloved Son whom I love. Listen to him. Suddenly, when they looked around, they no longer saw anyone with them except Jesus. As they were coming down the mountain, Jesus gave them orders not to tell anyone what they had seen until the Son of Man had risen from the dead. They kept the matter to themselves, discussing what rising from the dead meant. They asked him, Why do the teachers of the law say that Elijah must come first? Jesus replied, To be sure, Elijah does come first and restore all things. Why then is it written that the Son of Man must suffer much and be rejected? But I tell you, Elijah has come, and they've done to him everything they wished, just as it's written about him. Now let's go back to the beginning. After six days, Jesus takes his inner cabinet and goes up on a very high mountain, Peter, James, and John, the three who were allowed to share particular things that many other disciples didn't. They were there at the raising of Jairus' daughter. They were closer to him in the Garden of Gethsemane than anybody else. But here, there's something different happening. He goes onto this mountain and they go up with him. Suddenly, he is transfigured before them. What happens to Jesus? I believe he is clothed in the glory of the Lord our God. And in that moment, Moses and Elijah appear with him. Moses representing the Old Testament law, and Elijah representing the Old Testament prophets. Here, for a moment, is the Old Covenant with the New Covenant, Jesus Christ. And here is the most amazing scene ever seen. In fact, quite obviously, the Gospel writers can't really describe it. His clothes were whiter than anyone could bleach them. Well, what does that mean? Well, just the glory of God. You can't describe the glory of God in human terms. That's why the writers are struggling. Of course, poor Peter has to say something which was totally irrelevant. He spoke because he was frightened and he was speaking off the top of his head. What he says is, let's build three shelters so that we can stay here forever. But you see, when you see the glory of God, you never hold on to that forever. It's a glimpse. It's a special blessing. And then it passes away. Now, I believe something else. This comes from the teaching of Malcolm Smith, and I believe he's absolutely right. In that moment, 
when Jesus was transfigured, I really believe if he desired to, he could have gone on to be with the Father and never come down from that mountain. In other words, it wasn't just a moment of transfiguration. It was very definitely a moment of decision. Because if he went back to be with the Father, you and I would never have received salvation. So as he came down from the mount, he wasn't just coming off a mountain. He was coming back to die. A tremendous moment in the life and ministry of Jesus. Here he is glorified. Glorified as he was glorified after his resurrection. But he turned his back on that glory to face suffering and death. And when he faced suffering and death, the worst suffering he faced was to be made sin for us. Yes, there was torment, physical, mental. There was agony, that's true. But nothing like the agony of one who was perfect becoming sin and yet that's what he had to do he could not save us unless he took our sins upon himself and that was the horror of the cross and I believe that's what made him withdraw from the cross in the garden of Gethsemane and struggle with the decision but the decision was already made I think it was made long time before and I'm convinced it was confirmed here on the Mount of Transfiguration after this, Jesus set his face steadfastly to Jerusalem. He was heading to Jerusalem, not to go to Jerusalem, but to die. And when you hear that, and when you see that in your mind's eye, he's doing that for you. He's doing that for you because he loves you so much. That's the truth of the gospel story. So here are these disciples. They see this incredible sight, and then suddenly a cloud envelops them. And from the cloud, the voice of God speaks. And only on two occasions do we find this in the ministry of Jesus. First at his baptism, now at his transfiguration. This is my beloved son. Hear him. Listen to him. Take in what he's saying. What a moment. First of all, confirmation of who Jesus is. Secondly, confirmation of the message that he brought, that he's doing the right thing. And thirdly, the challenge. Listen. Understand it. Take it in. Make it yours. Absorb the message that my son is giving you. It's a fantastic moment. You simply see nothing like it anywhere else. And suddenly when they looked around, they no longer saw anyone with them except Jesus. It was passed as quickly as that. But what a moment. Jesus was glorified in their presence. And God gave the message. This is my son. He's doing a great job. But you men listen to what he has to say. Now as they came down from the mountain, Jesus told them not to tell anyone. He didn't want this spread around until after his resurrection. And interestingly enough, again they missed the point, you see. Don't tell anyone until I've risen from the dead. And the three of them missed it, at least John picked it up later. And then they asked him, why do the teach of the law say that Elijah must come first? It's strange, isn't it? They missed the central theme and went off on this sidetrack. And Jesus comes back with a fascinating reply. To be sure, Elijah does come first and restore all things. Why then is it written, the Son of Man must suffer much and be rejected? But I tell you, Elijah has come. And I believe that was John the Baptist. And they've done to him everything they wished, just as it's written about him. You see, John the Baptist came as the forerunner of the Messiah. He was there to prepare the way for the Lord. And he did, and he did it beautifully, and he did it magnificently. So Jesus could say that no one that was born of woman was greater than John the Baptist. A marvelous man. He had a job to do, and he did it. All the time pointing to Jesus. All the time pointing away from himself. That was a task of John the Baptist. And he followed it through. He did what he was asked to do. But you see, Elijah had already come. And it's strange when you think of it that when something so wonderful had happened 
in the presence of Peter, James and John that they could be sidetracked onto this very issue. But they spent time on it with Jesus and Jesus just immediately confirmed what they were thinking. Yes, he had. And notice what he also says here. And they did to Elijah, to John the Baptist, exactly what they wished. And in that you see there's a reflection that they're going to do just the same with the Son of Man. He's going to Jerusalem. He's going to be rejected. The chief priests, the scribes, the teachers of the law, the Pharisees, all the leaders of the Jews are going to take him and put him to death. They will do with him just what they wished. And you see, in that dreadful moment, you see that man is set free by God so often to exercise his free will. And that's why such dreadful things happen. Because God has given us free will, he doesn't violate it. And if we want to do something awful, he allows us to do it. Why? Because he leaves us free to do what we like so that we are free to love him. And in that freedom we sometimes sin and sometimes we love him. And quite obviously the Lord our God believes it's worth that divine risk to have the whole of mankind in freedom just so that we can respond to him through Jesus Christ and give him love, fellowship, service and all the things that he's asked of us. Do you hear what's going on here? Here's our Lord Jesus, glorified on the Mount of Transfiguration, turning his back on the glory of heaven, turning his back on the safety of the presence with his Father, and coming back to die on a cross, turning his back on the easy, and going through the most difficult thing he could possibly face. And the only reason for all this is because he loves us, because he loves you so much, because he loves me so much, he gave it all up for us. How much he must love us. And I don't think we always understand that. And I don't think we always appreciate it. But think about it today.